seats we're about to get back to it I love the title of our next speaker's talk how I met the Martians and wrote a UFO book our next speaker my friend Mark Hartman is abcnews.com called him one of America's leading connoisseurs of the bizarre and George Norrie of Coast to Coast AM said he's a, uh, quote, as bizarre at Robert, as Robert Ripley. Hartsman considers this both a high compliment since his passion for the unusual began in his youth with Ripley's Believe It or Not and the annual Guinness Book of World Records. In addition to his latest book, We Are Not Alone, Hartsman has also written about ghosts, Mars, Oliver Cromwell's embalmed head, weird things sold and bought on eBay, sideshow performers, and unorthodox messages from God. He's also written articles for Mental Floss, Huffington Post, AOL Weird News, AllThat'sInteresting.com, The Morbid Anatomy Online Journal, and Bizarre Magazine. He's uh, discussed oddities on CNN, CNBC, Ripley's Radio, History Channel's The Unexplained, and the Travel Channel's Mysteries of the Museum, at the museum, and dozens of podcasts. More of his love for the unusual can be found on his websites, weirdhistorian.com and markhartsmanbooks.com. Outside of these projects, Hartsman earns a living as an award-winning advertising creative director. Please give a big welcome to Mark Hartsman. Thanks so much, Peter. I appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Um, glad you're all here. So how I met the Martians and wrote a UFO book. This, by the way, is not the Martian that I met. Um, but we'll get to that in a moment. So I'm assuming that uh, since we're all here, you clearly have an interest in UFOs and aliens, um, science, science fiction. And so you may have found that interest in various ways. Maybe it came through some of the classic science fiction novels, uh, Ray Bradbury. Let's see if I can pull this out. Or not. I was going to walk and talk. Um, or anything by Arthur C. Clarke or Robert, he Robert Heinlein. Stranger in the Strange Line is a great one. Maybe it's from TV and movies, some of the fun, campy type of stuff from the 50s and 60s. This is an episode of Twilight Zone, one of the more humorous ones with a two-headed Martian. It's a great one if you haven't seen it. And Santa Claus Conquers the Martian, which is a, a wonderfully terrible movie from the, the 60s um, with a young Pia Zadora. But uh, it's very campy, very fun. But again, just kind of all these things are keeping Mars in the pop culture. Or maybe it's something more recent, uh, rover missions on Mars. The fact that we have robots on Mars is pretty amazing and you know, sparks an interest in science and even science fiction. Or classic UFO stories. I love this headline. This was front page news in 1955, the Kelly incident um, in Kentucky, just near Hopkinsville. Such a great headline. Um, but for me, I've always loved this topic. Um, I've been into it since I was a kid. These are a couple of the books I actually had when I was growing up in the, in the 80s. Uh, Communion, I got when that came out. And I mean, how can you not love that cover and be drawn to it? And uh, the UFO phenomena, I loved all the time life. Mysteries of the Unknown books. Maybe some of you here had those as well. But I had a whole bunch of those and of course, you know, still have them today. But uh, so that, 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 you know, interest was always in me, but it wasn't, 
until later that I really got into this. So in 2016, I had started a website called weirdhistorian.com, and I had a lot of stories on weird history. I love all kinds of strange weird history. And I had heard somewhere along the line that Nikola Tesla had tried contacting Mars in some way, and I thought, well, let me look, to, look into that. That would be a fun story to write for this, this site I was getting, you know, getting rolling. And I, so I started looking through newspaper archives online, and instead of finding the Tesla story, at least at the, you know, right off the bat, I stumbled across this story, and as you can see, the headline, uh, been to Mars, yep, talked to him, and saw big-eared folk. And I thought, this is 1926, by the way. And I thought, what, what is this? <laughs> this is like the strangest headline I've seen in the newspaper. So I put Tesla aside, and I started digging into this story more. And this was a man in London who's a London lawyer named Hugh Mansfield Robinson, and he claimed to be in telepathic communication with a Martian woman. She was seven feet tall, she had big ears, tall hair. In fact, as I dug further, I found an uh, illustration of her. Kind of has like Marge Simpson style hair. Um, her name was Umaruru, uh, which, which I love. I don't know if you can see it down there on, on the little model that was made. Um, but again, you have these amazing headlines about this story. Scientist hopes big eared Martians yet may get radio, says he has replied to radio to Mars. Um, his telepathic friend basically was talking about the giant Martians and said that they, they smoked pipes, drank tea, and drove cars, but never strike, he declares. So they were much more advanced than we were, much more civilized here on Earth. So basically what this guy was doing was he was claiming to have these telepathic communications and learning about all the wonders of Mars and Martian life. And he decided he was going to try to send a telegram to Mars in 1926 because Mars was in opposition that year. And that means that's the point in its orbit when it's closest to Earth. So it's about 35 million miles away. So at that time, London had the world's most powerful radio tower in the world. It was called Rugby Radio Tower. And he decided that he could send a telegram uh, at that point. It was October 1926. And maybe that could reach Mars and we could get a response. This is actually from the British Telecommunications Archive. This is the, uh, one of the memos um, that was uh, going with, the, with this attempt to send a telegram. He sent it twice. This was actually, so 1926, this may not surprise you, but he didn't hear a response um, from the Martians. 1928, opposition happened once again, so he tried again. And again, this was making headlines, by the way, around the world. This was written up in the New York Times. I think you saw one of those clips was from the Times. Um, this was major world news. And here you can see this was the telegram that he sent. Um, it basically says uh, Mars, I think it says God is love here. That's basically what it's trying to say, Mars to Earth. Um, so it's just sort of a small rudimentary message that he's sending. And he was being charged a long distance rate by the post office, which I thought was kind of fun because the post office was, was getting a lot of press for this case and they were basically getting free advertising for their long distance rate because the stories were talking about it. So it was benefiting them at least. Um, again, uh, didn't get a response. But he did say, because he was, you know, he could always telepathically communicate with Imaruru, and she was informing him that the scientists did receive the message. But the problem was on our end. Our scientists were not smart enough to receive the messages. This is what he was saying. So you can see here, uh, uh, this is a, I got the wrong thing in my hand now. This was a headline, uh, this was from the Times. Britain says Martians failed to get his radio, were annoyed at having to sit up all night. In fact, this was driving the Martians a little crazy. What's going on? And then here you can see they're all gathered around waiting. This image from a, a newspaper from, again, from 1928. So as I'm researching this, again, this is just really to me was an incredible story. All the efforts he was going to, the stories he had, Umaruru's tales of Mars. And the more I researched that, the more I started to uncover what was going on in the periphery. And this was just stuff I, I never learned about. I don't know if anyone here had heard of Umaruru before, um, but I certainly hadn't. So I start learning about all the different scientists and astronomers, uh, aside from Tesla. I did find out eventually. We'll get back to that in a second. But a lot of scientists had real serious thought about intelligent life on Mars and what they might look like and how we might communicate with them. So this is a headline, New York Times from 1909. 1909 was a pretty big year. That was another year Mars was in opposition. Um, and a lot of scientists were really trying that year to make contact with Martians. And so here, this is William Henry Pickering. He was the head of astronomy at Harvard. So again, that's fairly prestigious. This is a Harvard guy who's exploring this idea. He wanted to create a grid of 50 giant mirrors. 
um, massive mirrors, put them all like a, a huge grid, and then they reflect sunlight to send light signals, flashes to Mars. And he thought with that kind of size, eventually they would see, if they had equipment like, like we might have, they might see those flashes from Earth and eventually be able to send a signal back to us so they know there's some communication. Um, that would have cost, by the way, $10 million uh, in 1909, which is, a, I think, about a quarter of a billion dollars today. Um, that said, he never got the funding. But he did say this. As far as the people of Mars are concerned, this reflector would not, of course, be apparent to the naked eye, but through lenses of such magnitude as we have today, the reflection would be easily discernible and would, be, uh, and would undoubtedly attract attention at once. So again, he, he thought, like, you know, this is, this is a good idea if we can get it to work. Another professor from Amherst, his name was David Todd, he had another idea in 1909. He thought, well, we don't need a bunch of mirrors flashing signals. He said, they're probably sending us stuff already. So what if we create a hot air balloon that can ascend 50,000 feet in the air? No one had ever gone 50,000 feet in the air before in a hot air balloon. But he thought, if we can get that high, we can get above all the interference that might be causing you know, disruptions and getting a signal um, from Mars. So he was working on these plans, and you can, you can see He's got a little illustration here going straight to Mars. There's the canals. We'll talk about that in a second. Here's a little, uh, little carriage he'd be sitting in um, as he goes up 50,000 feet. He was going to bring his wife with him, by the way, so it's a nice you know, uh, couple adventure. Um, that never happened. He did try in 1920 to do it once again. It was another year of opposition. And uh, he was actually getting help from, from the government. He had, I think, their head of... of uh, hot air balloon, chief hot air balloon engineer, I forgot what exactly his uh, title was, but, but there was someone with that position who was helping him with it, and then they canceled it at the last minute. But he was doing, he did a test flight up to 5,000 um, feet in the air, but never actually got to do his 50,000 foot adventure. But again, he had a great quote about it. If life really exists on Mars, they've been trying for years to get in the conversation with us and perhaps wonder what manner of stupid things we are not to respond. I love that quote and the whole attitude behind it. So this was 1912. This was a French botanist named Edmund Perrier. This comes from the New York Times, by the way. And he was working with them on what he thought Martians might look like. And that was based on what we knew about the planet at the time. So it was based on the physics that we had available to us about, you know, about Mars. So we thought because their gravity um, is much, much uh, lower than Earth, it's one third of that, that that we have here on Earth, he thought, well, that meant that they would grow taller. Not, they're not being pushed down as much to the ground, so they would probably be really tall and therefore have thin legs and a large chest to breathe in the thin air. Um, the big ears also, I think, because of the thinner atmosphere. Uh, and you can see that they're very advanced. There's like a little, a little science, scientist here doing something, and you got some airships here and some kind of gizmo powering it. So you can see how advanced they were. So, of course, like I said, I did find Nikola Tesla. Um, he was believing he could contact Mars or other planets even in the late 1800s, late 1890s. So this was something he was very interested in for the rest of his life, by the way. He never really gave up on his search for a way to contact extraterrestrial life. Um, this is a headline from 1897. Tesla tells how we shall talk with other worlds. And you can see you know, the different planets there. He's hoping we can reach through different kinds of radio waves. And in 1899, he was working in his laboratory in Colorado Springs, uh, top Pikes Peak, and he believed he got a signal that was not from Earth. And he said, brethren, we have a message from another world, unknown and remote. It reads, one, two, three. So he was convinced that some kind of communication had been established. And as I said, he certainly wasn't alone. Another name you guys might recognize is Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi. This was from 1920. Marconi asked, is Mars signaling Earth? Weird sounds on the wireless. So Marconi that year had received a signal that was, I believe it was 100,000 meters of wavelength. And, and he said, well, this is, this is nothing that I've seen before. This does not seem to be originating from Earth. It must be coming from somewhere else. Um, his inclinations were to say it was coming from Mars. 
And so he believed this for a couple of years. He kept researching it, trying to find another signal or figuring out like what this could be or how to how to respond to it. And then he finally got his answer a couple of years later. It turned out that he he uh, discovered it was coming from GE, uh, a secret test that they were doing from not not from Mars, but from the less less exotic Schenectady, New York. So that that may have been a bit of a letdown after his two-year quest to, to find the Martians. So I'm going to jump back in time a little bit now um, to 1838, just because I want to get some more context in. This wasn't something that just popped up in the early 1900s or with Tesla. This had been brewing for quite some time, uh, even before this, but that's all in the book. <laughs> but this is a man named Thomas Dick. He was an amateur astronomer uh, in England, and he basically created this book called uh, Celestial Scenery, or the Wonders of the Planetary System Displayed. And in that, he essentially created a census of the universe, the solar system, as we know it. And he decided, you know, he had, again, they had some knowledge of the sizes of planets at that point. And so he took the knowledge he had, and he wanted to figure out the population, because he believed every planet was populated. So he figured out the population by using data from Earth. So he took the population of a square mile in Great Britain, which was 208 people, and he extrapolated from there. So he said, okay, well, we know Mars is this big. Um, therefore, his calculations came to 15 billion Martians. However, he subtracted a third, accounting for possible oceans. So he decided Martians, there were probably about 10 billion Martians alive. Um, but as I said, he calculated the whole solar system. So his calculations for the whole solar system were 22 trillion beings in the universe. Now that doesn't include the sun. The sun, uh, he estimated 681 trillion creatures living on the sun, as I call them, sun bathers. Um, so this, this was the thought at the time. So fast forwarding a few years, this is Carl Friedrich Gauss, he's a German uh, mathematician, scientist, um, very intelligent guy. And he decided, well, if there is something out there, how can we reach them? What can we do to try and make contact? So he decided he wanted to try to create a gigantic Pythagorean theorem uh, triangle with the squares. And basically, if, if he could use the universal language of math, people would know there's intelligence here. Like, oh, they, everyone can speak math, whether, you know, forget language, you can understand shapes and mathematical symbols and, and uh, calculations. So he thought, well, if we can do this in the Siberian tundra using pine trees and fields of wheat, we can make this thing enormous big enough that they could see from where they are, again, assuming they'd have some sort of telescopes or something to look through, but it would have to be that big for them to see it. Um, again, this didn't happen, but this was a theory he put out there. A few years later, uh, Joseph Johann von Littrow, an Austrian astronomer, kind of built on the idea a little bit. He had a similar thought, using math again as a universal language. And he decided that we should build, again, shapes. So for example, uh, he wanted to go into the Sahara Desert and create a, a circle, for example, that was 20 miles in diameter. And within that 20 mile diameter, he'd, create, he'd dig uh, trenches to create the shape. And the trenches might be as, as wide as 20, uh, you know, 100 yards or so for each of this, this whole trench going around the circle. But not only that, he wanted to fill that trench with kerosene and light it on fire. So at night, you'd have a giant flaming circle on Earth signaling um, that Earth is full of pyromaniacs. So again, this never happened, but it was an interesting uh, way to approach it and you know, a way to kind of show that someone is over here in case they were there. So that brings us up to uh, a French astronomer whose name is Camille Flammarion. And in 1862, he was very interested in Mars. In 1862, he wrote a book called On the Plurality of Inhabited Worlds. And he put forth his thoughts on the idea of life on other plants. Um, and this came out three years after um, Darwin's On the Origin of Species. And so he took that idea of evolution, and he thought, OK, well, evolution would apply everywhere. That wouldn't just apply on Earth, but that would apply across the solar system. And therefore, Mars would be further advanced. So by his reasoning being that Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, therefore, in its creation, it would have cooled earlier and therefore begun its uh, progress of life sooner. So at any given point, Mars would be further advanced than we are. Um, so that was kind of his thinking about, about Martian life. And he really romanticized it. Because they would be further advanced, he imagined it would be much, much better, again, much more advanced than here on Earth. In fact, he said this. 
As for me, I rather envy them. A world where it is always beautiful, where there are neither tempests nor cyclones, where the years are twice as long as ours, where in a world, in a word, everything is lighter, more delicate, and more refined. So again, this was, like I said, his romanticized vision of what Mars would like to be. And you know, if he could have gone there, he would have. Shortly after that, this is sort of the big breakthrough. Um, this was Giovanni Scaparelli, who was an Italian astronomer. And in 1877, he looked through his telescope and he saw what he saw, like basically a network of lines crisscrossing the entire planet of Mars. And so he called them canali, which translates to channels. Channels, of course, can be naturally created. However, canali got mistranslated uh, into canals. And that's a big difference. Canals are artificially created, um, not natural. Just to give you a sense of uh, context, the Suez Canal had just been completed recently, it took 10 years, and this was a huge engineering feat, like I said, 10 years to create it. So he's looking at an entire planet covered in canals, and he thought, my God, these people must be, you know, they must be amazing engineers to create uh, a system of canals like that. So that theory really was pro uh, promoted by Percival Lowell. So Lowell, um, Lowell came from Lowell, Massachusetts, named after his family. They were very wealthy. Uh, they ran a textile business. They were entrenched in Harvard. And the thought was that Percival would follow in the family footsteps, take over the business, work at Harvard, all these good things. But Percival wasn't interested in that. He wanted to make his name in a different way. He did, went traveling abroad for a while. He got interested in astronomy. And Scaparelli was getting older and was starting to go blind. And basically, Percival Lowell kind of took the torch from Scaparelli and really pushed this idea of the canal systems on Mars. He went out to Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894 and built uh, an, uh, an observatory, which is still there today. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting during research for this book and going through his personal files. Um, but it's really amazing what he did and what he saw. Here's one of his illustrations of Mars. And of course, not only did he lecture a lot on the subject, he wrote numerous books on it, and he was you know, quoted in newspapers all the time, so he had these amazing stories about what was going on there. So for example, who dug the canals on Mars? Uh, the reason for the belief that the planet is inhabited by human beings, he thought it was a huge scheme of irrig irrigation. He believed that the planet was dying, it was drying out, so let's take the, the water from the polar caps and distribute it across the planet through these canals. And here, I just love this illustration of finding Martians from a lonely mountain in Arizona. Um, this is just a spread from the book. This idea was, like I said, was really getting picked up about these Martian canal diggers. So again, it's just this uh, amazing illustration here of this giant Martian with his, his shovel full of dirt. Um, and the quote here, fancy a company of Martian laborers imported from their distant plant to dig the Panama Canal. Digging such a little ditch would be a matter of merely a few weeks exercise. That's from the Washington Times in 1907. The Panama Canal had been in the works for quite some time and was having, you know, having a lot of trouble finishing it at that point. So hey, let's get these Martians out. They seem to know what they're doing. So not only was this astronomers and scientists taking interest in this possibility, but even spiritualists. So in the late 1800s, the whole Victorian era, spiritualism was a huge movement. There was millions of people were following this idea that we could communicate with the dead, um, that you don't die, there's always communication thereafter. And so a particular medium, she was a Swiss medium named Helene Smith, she claimed to have her spirit traveling to Mars and she was describing life on Mars. And of course, this might not be surprising, but they were building their home, homes next to the canals as one might expect, just like we're near roads and, you know, uh, civilization, basically. Um, so she was describing life, and she even had the alphabet. This is the Martian alphabet you're looking at from 1895. Um, she was studied by psychologists. Eventually, I think they thought that she was just merging some French and Swiss together to create this language. Um, but like I said, this was spreading to all different kinds of people. Even advertisers. Um, so I love this. This is... Uh, a booklet that came straight from Percival Lowell's um, scrapbook. So this is this is like an early pharma ad, basically. This is a little booklet. It was called the Mars Gazette, and the story that's told in this uh, little booklet is that a doctor with these particular pills um, had basically sold them to all the doctors of Earth, and it was curing everybody with some sort of miracle cure-all pill. And now he needed to expand his market. So where do you go? You go to Mars. There's plenty of people there. So here he is flying on Mars, distributing 
giving his medication to those uh, alien from whatever they're alien from on Mars. And it's probably a little hard to read from back there, but this illustration here of the uh, king of Mars flying on this winged creature is King Flammarion. So sort of a nice homage to Camille Flammarion, who we just spoke about. And soap companies also got very into the scene. They loved Martians. Apparently Martians really stink. Um, so they were willing to help them out with that situation. I don't know why that was the assumption, but uh, I love this. Mars is peopled and they want Kirk's soap. <laughs> and then this one, uh, send us up some Piers soap. That's the first message from Mars. So maybe when we do make contact with extraterrestrials, that will be their first request. Is can we get some soap? That'll be the, the big puzzle we've been searching for. So of course, all these thoughts, they you know, became part of popular culture, inspired different writers and thinkers. Um, here you're seeing John Carter of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, by the way, John Carter, if any of you have read those, he starts off in a cave in Arizona, probably not far from the Lowell Observatory. I'm sure it was inspired by Percival Lowell. And this is a Science and Invention magazine. This is from 1924 with an illustration of a Martian. This, is, uh, this was a magazine published by Hugo Gernsback. He's actually the man who coined the term science fiction. Um, if anyone here likes science fiction novels, there's an award called the Hugo, which is named after Gernsback. He also predicted a lot of different technologies that would come to pass. Um, so this guy was a very interesting scientific thinker, and he wrote in this magazine uh, his whole idea on the evolution of Martians. And so this is what his Martian would look like. Um, which is not unlike the one we looked at from the New York Times in 1912 by Edmund Perrier. So again, you have the sort of tall, spindly legs, the large chest, hair is more of a snout to kind of pull in the scent from the, through that thin atmosphere, and the antenna, I think he believed that they could communicate telepathically. Um, so again, this is what, this is what young scientists or, or young, you know, avid readers are reading these things. In fact, Jack Parsons, uh, who would be worth a whole other conversation discussion, the, one of the chief guys who helped create NASA JPL um, and helped found the American rocketry program, he used to read Hugo Gernsback. Um, so again, these things all inspire one generation after another. Even though some of these ideas might sound kind of odd and unusual, they inspire scientists, they inspire writers, writers inspire next generations of scientists and so on and so forth. So it's all, it's all connected. Now, this all leads up to 1938, and I'm guessing everyone here is familiar with The War of the Worlds, um, not only the book, but the Orson Welles production of it that scared the entire nation, um, terrified the nation, I should say. <laughs> so this was October 30th, 1938. Orson Welles does his dramatization of H.G. Wells, no relation, um, of his War of the Worlds uh, story. And, and it's incredibly well done. If, if you guys haven't listened to a recording of it, you absolutely should. It's amazing how brilliant, brilliantly he used the medium of radio, which was still relatively new, just between the, the live bands that might be playing, orchestras, and then cutting in with news reports, interrupting it, going back, interrupting once again. It felt very, very authentic. Um, and keep in mind that World War II was brewing over in Europe, and so the idea of these emergency breakthroughs was not that unusual. It happened, so here was yet another one. And of course, you know, I, I, this is a story I always knew about growing up, and, and I always looked at like, that's so silly. How could people think that Martians attacked the Earth? So keep in mind everything we just talked about. People have been seeing headlines for decades from major people like Tesla and Pickering at Harvard, Marconi, that Martians might be trying to get in touch with us any time, and we might, it might happen very soon. So if you're hearing this and it's done so authentically, it's not hard to believe that you might actually believe it. Um, also, part of that reason is because people tuned in late um, to the broadcast. They were listening to Edgar Bergen and his dummy, Charlie McCarthy. Uh, they were very popular on the radio. Uh, and I, I've always found that amusing because it's a ventriloquism act on the radio. That never really computed to me, but <laughs> seems like a comedy act, not a ventriloquism act. But anyway, that's another story. But they tuned in late, and so they tuned in late after that show ended, and they basically missed the uh, at least the first introduction of the broadcast, which said it was a dramatization. So people just missed it, and all they heard was these cra you know these crazy updates on the Martian attacks happening in New Jersey. Like I said, Orson Welles put on quite a production here. Um, I think he was surprised afterward that he crazed, uh, created such a panic in the streets. 
Now, you would think that after that, because that was, like I said, that was a big story. That scared a lot of people. Um, actually, in the book, I talk about one man who, who, at least one person who died of a heart attack believing that this was happening, looking for the Martians out his window. So you think, well, that's probably never going to happen again. People won't believe that Martians are attacking again after that. Um, but they did. Um, so 11 years later, in 1949, in Quito, Ecuador, a couple other radio DJs were looking for something to, to drum up some publicity for their station. So they said, hey, let's do that War of the Worlds thing. And unlike Orson Welles, they didn't bother with the idea of, hey, it's a dramatization of the novel. They just went for it. And of course, they localized it. It's attacking a nearby, uh, a place nearby Quito, not actually Quito. Um, they had uh, radio actors impersonating the mayor, uh, the local priest. So it sounded like your real officials at the small town that they knew were, were, you know, describing what was going on. The entire police force, you know, fled town to go help the battle that they were being told was happening, like in a nearby town adjacent. Um, and so when word got out on the street that that this was all just a radio show, people were pretty pissed off, as you can imagine, and they formed a mob, and they marched down to a radio station, and uh, they lit it on fire. They were so angry, and the fire trucks couldn't get there in time because of the mob was blocking the streets and everything. Fifteen people ended up dying um, from that incident, so the Martians ended up killing 15 humans in uh, 1949. So all of this leads up into the late 1940s, uh, the UFO craze begins in 1947. On June 24th, Kenneth Arnold sees the nine flying disks over Mount Rainier in Washington, and of course the term flying saucer is born from that. Uh, and it's, the, you know, after that happened, of course, thousands of reports from across the country happened about different kinds of flying saucer sightings. And, and naturally, some of those were attributed to being from Mars. Again, we've been kind of, you know, learning about Martians for so long, so it wasn't surprising that people would automatically assume that, oh, they must be coming from Mars. Um, this is another just a couple pages from the Big Book of Mars. I love this title, Flying Saucer from Mars, uh, by Cedric Allingham. And he describes his whole experience being a Martian. Um, I also talked on the book how this book ended up being a hoax. Um, that came out later. His name wasn't Cedric Allingham. He just wrote this to kind of, uh, in his mind, spoof what was going on. Um, I love this one as well. This is this might be my favorite headline aside from Umaruru, but super bees believed to be pilots of flying saucers, and it says you know from Mars right here. And so the thought was that maybe insects could could survive in the conditions of Mars, and they might uh, have evolved. Uh, if you think about it, I and mean, he actually gives an interesting theory on it, bees are pretty industrious. They they make their their hives and so forth. And what if they became intelligent? That comes from this book, The Riddle of the Flying Saucers, uh, which is a really great book. Um, and of course, at that time, too, you have sort of the first major whistleblower from the military come out, Donald Kehoe. Uh, this is a quote from him. I believe spaceships are the only answer. The Earth has been under periodic observation from another planet for at least two centuries. And so he became very vocal in talking about what, you know, what was happening uh, through the, the military, what was being hidden, and so forth. And like I said, you just had headlines across the nation about this subject. People were reporting so many different sightings. I love this one. Eight flying saucers land in Idaho. Witness says, just huge, you know, spired over the front page. And I just want to call out the date here. July 7th, 1947. That's a day before probably the most famous UFO headline from Roswell about the um, Roswell Army Air Force uh, airfield capturing the flying saucer. And that was July 8th, 1947. So right before Roswell, this was even huge, huge stories. So I, I talked about the Roswell story a little bit in the Big Book of Mars, but there's so much there, so much information, obviously, so many stories to tell. I decided I wanted to uh, do more with that information and, and explore it further. So that became my new book, we Are Not Alone, um, which will be available next month, October 17th, um, which you can pre-order now. But uh, this, this really gave me a chance to explore more of the UFO phenomena. And in creating this, this book, I got to speak with so many different amazing people, um, visit so many different places. I spoke with ufologists, you know, various researchers, archivists. Um, experiencers, people who um, had abduction experiences, scientists, uh, again, 
and to, yeah, people involved in SETI. So really just discussing the topic with all different kinds of people. And like I said, a lot of different travels as well. So my first trip, uh, my first stop on, the, on the, this adventure was Washington, D.C. Um, this was October of 2021. And uh, Robert Salas, retired Air Force captain, held this, this press briefing at the National Press Room, um, along with three other retired Air Force captains to talk about different sightings they'd had in the 60s with UFOs over nuclear sites. Very interesting. Um, I, I took this picture because I kind of love the sign right outside the room, USA, USAF officers to present evidence of UFOs tampering with nuclear weapons at 9 a.m. So they all spoke. They had fascinating stories. Um, I, I speak about them a lot in the book, but they talked about you know, these different cases which really have never been explained. Um, they're very compelling. Bob's case uh, was at Malmstrom in 1967, and basically uh, he, he had seen a UFO overhead. There were lots of reports of a UFO overhead down below where he was stationed at that point. Uh, after, well, after he'd seen the UFO, he then went down, and then 10 ICBMs went offline. And he's, he described they're not interconnected, they're all interdependent of each other. So it's not like you have a glitch and they all go down. You'd have to have 10 glitches happen simultaneously for all 10 to go down. And as he said, one glitch never happened. So how did 10 suddenly happen? Uh, it was never explained. Uh, interestingly enough, though, Last May at the congressional hearing, uh, Wisconsin Representative Mike Gallagher asked a question to the two representatives from the, United, uh, the uh, uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, UAP Task Force, and he asked them about Malmstrom, and they said, oh, I don't really know about it, which seems odd. But he requested that they look into it, and they said, well, we don't do that unless it's an official order, and Gallagher said, well, this is, a, this is pretty official. So who knows, maybe they'll actually dig into it, maybe something uh, more will come out of it one way or the other. But I, I love this quote from Bob. Um, he said, UFOs disabled 20 nuclear missiles within the span of eight days. There's no question about this. In my opinion, UFOs are simply reminding us that we should seriously try to eliminate these weapons. Uh, it says 20 because eight days earlier, another 10 had been disabled at a separate site. So that's, that's where the 20 comes from. And it's a nice thought to think, well, could UFOs actually, could that be true? There was the atomic age you know, that was coming out of World War II, and um, lots of people believe that's why the sightings were happening, because they were just, you know, concerned about what was going on in this planet. Could there be some truth to that? Could they be looking over nuclear sites, making sure that we don't kill ourselves and that, you know, damage more of the universe? So maybe, it's a nice thought. We're still here, so that's good. So I also went to New Mexico. Um, New Mexico just feels like you, you gotta go there for researching UFOs. And this is, uh, if anyone here is familiar with um, David Marler, he's uh, an archivist and historian who has this just massive collection. He lives outside of Albuquerque. And he was gracious enough to let me come to his home and his, spend the weekend in his archives going through his files. And he has a lot of files. This is not only his collection, but he's absorbed collections from other organizations like he has the entire Project Blue Book files and um, other various collectors. He's gotten all of their, their information. And he's doing a great job of cataloging, cataloging and archiving and digitizing the information. But you can see this is just one row of, of his file cabinets. Each of these file cabinets is packed with case files. And I'm, this is you know, early in my research, and I'm like, well, where do I even begin? Let's <laughs> open this one, see what's in here. I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. And this room, he's just got uh, a ton of stuff. He's got multimedia over here, basically able to use any kind of media over the decades, whether it's, you know, real, real film or, or VHS or recordings and so forth. He had, you know, hundreds of books, thousands of newspaper clippings, um, every, everything you could want, uh, like a treasure trove of information to go through. And he was hugely helpful in giving me his own stories and sharing his own information and taking me through some of his materials. This is just a sample. I, what I would do is I would take photos of as much as I possibly could to take with me um, so I could sort through more information later so I wasn't wasting too much time researching one thing, but I could work on it later. So that's just a glimpse of photos on my, uh, on my iPhone. I mentioned he had a lot of books. I love these books from the 50s uh, with the contactees, people who said they were meeting Venusians, they were taking trips and flying saucers, flying saucers were giving information from other planets, all sorts of interesting communications going on. So just a few titles here, Board of Flying Saucer, The Saucers Speak and Inside of Spaceships by George Adamski, who's probably the most famous of the contactees, claimed he met the Venusians and later flew on Martian spacecraft and Saturn, uh, Saturnarian spacecrafts. Um, so again, just 
just sort of fascinating part of the culture. Um, these are the guys also who maybe, you know, caused some of the stigma to arise. Uh, scientists maybe didn't want to be associated with the guys who said they were being Venusians out in the desert. And so that may have started creating that separation, uh, which we're now finally getting past. But as I was going through these books and kind of collecting some of the stories and some of the artwork, I kept moving these, these little index cards that were in the way on one of the bookshelves. Just take them off, pull the book out, put the cards back, so I put the book back. And finally I said, well, what are these cards that keep moving? Why don't I should be looking at these? And, and these were pretty cool. I love these, so I gave one example here. This was uh, a lecture card from Howard Menger, who was one of the contactees. Um, and it's just basically coming here all about flying saucers and space visitors. So he'd invite people to his lectures. He had a mailing list, I suppose, and, and contactees would do this often. They'd hold their lectures and invite people um, and spread their word, basically. After leaving David Mother's archive, of course, I went to Roswell. How could you do a UFO book without going to Roswell? Um, and I love I loved going to Roswell. If you haven't been there, it's just uh, they've completely embraced it. It feels like just like the town today here for this weekend. But Roswell, you know, they, they have it embraced uh, all year round. This is the McDonald's there, shaped like a UFO, like flying saucer, which I thought was really fun. There's aliens inside too, by the way. Dunkin' Donuts is being held up by a giant alien. This is all like down Main Street. They have lamp poster alien heads. Just a little souvenir shop I thought was really cool. And then I went to the Roswell, uh, the, you know, the UFO Museum, and they have a huge research center as well. This was a mural painted outside, which I just thought was, was quite beautiful. And, and so I had contacted them ahead of time saying I was coming to make sure I could get access to, to the archives. The, the museum is open to the public, but the research library wanted to make sure I could have access. I didn't, I didn't quite know how that was operated. And so they said, yeah, no problem. I was going to be there on a Monday. They said, no problem. Just show up. We'll let you in. It's fine. So I got there. I got up at like 6 a.m. left Albuquerque. It's a three-hour drive. And it's, it's uh, most of that is through nothing. Um, the last 100 miles or so is basically straight road in the middle of nowhere. I literally had the tumbleweed pass in front of me like a cliche. And then you come into Roswell and you see all the things I was just talking about. I get to the museum right when they're opening, like after, not after 9 o'clock or so. And I go in, I say who I am. I said, I'd you know, like to use the research library. Oh, it's closed today. Like, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's closed. I, I talked to uh, you know, the executive director. And fortunately, um, she was there and they went back and talked to her. And she came out and she gave me access. So thank goodness. I was like, I, I can't believe I came all this and you guys are closed today. But uh, again, this is just a, a portion of the room that they had there. So the same kind of feeling I had going into David Mother's archive, it's overwhelming. You just got boxes and boxes on shelves and shelves. And each of these boxes is packed with, with magazines, uh, files, clippings, and so forth, all kinds of ephemera. And again, where do you begin? I've only got so much time to go through this. But, you know, went through a similar process, grabbed a lot of information that seemed interesting, took photos. I could, I could kind of process it later. Um, but again, an interesting part of, of the whole experience. The other cool thing I got to do in Roswell, besides just sort of experiencing the whole feel and atmosphere of Roswell and, and getting the research done, um, when I was at, at um, David Mother's archive, he was telling me that he had met a guy who lived in Roswell who had a UFO experience in 1964 when he was eight years old. And he was living in Roswell now. This took place in Hobbs, uh, New Mexico at the time. He's like, yeah, he's living there. He never talks about this. Uh, he'd come across a newspaper clipping of it. Um, this is the guy, his name is Chuck Davis and his wife. We met at a Mexican restaurant and had lunch as he shared his stories with me. But um, David had found this article, set a fire by a black blob. Blob, excuse me. And, and this was never explained. And basically when he was eight, he was outside of his, his grandmother's uh, laundromat that they had. And a top-shaped UFO was kind of moving back and forth. And he was moving back and forth. It was almost like kind of marrying him. And then shoots over right above his head. And it like, belches out a blast of fire and burns him. And his grandmother sees that and rushes out. And he's like, he's burned from like the, basically the neck up. It's horrible. And so he's rushed to the hospital. Fortunately, a burn specialist was there, helped him right away. The FBI came and investigated. No one ever found any evidence left that would explain these burns that this kid got. All they had was what he's described and his grandmother described, and there was nothing else that explained it. Um, and so he had talked to reporters at the 
the time, he ended up talking to, to James McDonald, the UFO investigator in the late 60s, I think 68, I have a recording of their conversation, and then that was it until I talked to David Marler maybe maybe three or four years ago, um, and then he talked to me. So this wasn't something where he was out telling the story, it was something he put on the shelf, didn't want to talk about, um, but basically he had this odd experience, was living in Roswell, and it was just, like I said, a strange, unexplained thing. And he said, like, I don't know what it was. He recovered fully. You can see, see, see by his photo before. He looks fine now. Um, but what was odd, and this was something that, that David had uncovered, around that same time in 1964, like within the month following, there were other sightings of top-shaped UFOs belching fire on people and burning people. Um, so this one, this is July 16th, 1964, uh, in Georgia, unidentified flying object with bad smell reported in Tacoa. And it was happening on Tuesday nights. <laughs> in different states, and people were holding watch parties looking for this top shape thing. It's just a weird little blip in, in UFO culture that happened in, I guess, summer, spring, summer of 1964, in at least New Mexico, Georgia, and I think North Carolina, and none of them have ever been explained. Um, I tell that whole story in the introduction to the book. I thought it was a great way to start a UFO book about a Roswell story that wasn't Roswell, and that no one had really heard since maybe James McDonald in 1968. On my way out of Roswell, I had to get a picture of the famous Roswell sign because I'd forgotten to get it on the way in because I was so excited to get to the museum. And I almost forgot to get on the way out. I had to make a U-turn on the highway. And thankfully, no one's on that highway, um, so that was fine. <laughs> but it's a pretty cool. Actually, the lights change colors, uh, and, and it's pretty, pretty fun. So worth, uh, worth a traffic offense, potentially. I also visited Peter Robbins' home. Peter was gracious enough to host me. Um, as you heard, if you were in his talk earlier, he's got a, an amazing collection of UFO artifacts. He not only shared a lot of his uh, collection with me, but also his experiences and stories. These are just a few of the pieces I just love. I love the artwork. I love the headline here. It was seduced by a flying saucer. So much fun stuff. Um, these images actually didn't ultimately make it into the book, um, but I thought I could share them here. This one's kind of fun. This is a, a record, Music from Another Planet. This was Howard Menger record album um, that was created from uh, aliens. So we talked about him earlier with that lecture card. But Peter, I think, I think Peter actually showed this image earlier during his talk, but his sister, as you heard, if you were here earlier, they had a, a UFO experience um, when they were growing up in 1961. Peter was, I believe, 14, his sister was 12, and she claimed to have been abducted by aliens, and later, years later, drew these images to represent what she remembered. Um, so I, I got the chance to tell Peter's story uh, in the book as well, um, in his sister's experience. And I love the fact that this story, um, if you're familiar with like you know the, the UFO abduction stories, usually the, Betty and Barney Hill are considered the first um, abduction story in America. Certainly the first that was out in the press and documented um, for the world to hear about. Peter didn't talk about this in 1961, but this was months before the Betty and Bill, uh, Betty and Barney Hill story. I spoke with other people who claim to have hybrid children through aliens. Um, this is something that's out there in, in UFO lore as well, are their hybrids. And this is some artwork by uh, an amazing artist. She draws a lot of um, these kinds of hybrid, hybrid children uh, illustrations. Um, and last year I was at the MUFON uh, uh, symposium in Denver, and I met a woman there. She, had a, she was selling a book called The Art of the Close Encounter, which was a beautiful book of artwork. It was all, all kind of like this, just different artists. Um, with the artwork of UFOs, alien spaceships, based on experiences or, or not. And I bought the book from her and um, was telling her about the book I was doing. And she told me that she'd had a lot of experiences. I said, oh, you know, can you share some of those experiences with me? And she said, oh, sure, let's go sit down. So I went and sat down like over in the, the lounge area and she talked to me for quite a while about a lot of her experiences with UFOs. Uh, so she had been abducted many times, she claimed, and had many hybrid children. Um, she also was the camera woman for Baywatch. So if you guys remember Baywatch with Pamela Anderson and David Hasselhoff. So she was living in Malibu. This was around 1988 when she had her first sighting and, and this first abduction. And she talked about so nonchalantly, like, well, yeah, it's just, it's just stuff that happened to me. <laughs> it was very interesting how cavalier she was about the whole thing. But she would tell me that a lot of times she'd be late 
paid for work because of these abduction um, situations. And after the abductions, the government would take her down to a secret bunker underground and, and deal with her there in some way. Um, and so she'd often be late for work. And, and the whole crew knew about her stories. David Hasselhoff would write up on his, I guess, on his buggy or whatever on the beach and say, oh, did you get abducted by a UFO again? So they all knew about this. And so she told me that one day she was late again and her producer said, come on, Kim, where have you been? Let's go. You're late. Come down to the beach. You got to see what we have waiting for you. And she goes down to the beach and it's filled with um, radio telescopes. And they were basically filming an episode about a UFO encounter and abduction. Um, so I love that whatever happened to Kim Carlsberg, it did make a little ding in the pop culture, uh, immortalized in an episode of Baywatch. So switching gears a little bit from hybrid children and UFOs uh, and aliens to just more of a scientific effort to contact extraterrestrial life. So scientists have generally, they haven't, you know, until recent affairs, which we'll get to in a moment, never really spent a lot of efforts trying to see what might be in the skies above us here. But they have looked for what could be out there further in the galaxy. Um, that's, of course, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And this really started around 1959, 1960, with uh, a guy named Frank Drake. He was a brilliant man, a physicist, a astronomer. And he was working at the uh, National Radio Observatory in, West, uh, in Green Bank, West Virginia. And they had this massive radio telescope, and he had the idea, like, could I use this to detect radio signals from other planets? And so he started a few projects that started listening, and he had a few moments where he thought he, he had gotten a message. He eventually you know, learned that it was not what he thought it was, but he had a few spikes of excitement. But it kept the conversation going. And so in 1961, he held a conference at, at, uh, at Green Bank in West Virginia, and he invited several scientists, uh, I, th I think around nine or ten scientists, including a young Carl Sagan, and he wanted to create an agenda for this conversation to further this idea of contacting or finding signals from extraterrestrials, um, intelligent life out in the, in, the, in the universe. And so he created this equation. This is called the Drake Equation. And I know it uh, looks like a lot of math, but it's actually a pretty simple. And each of these variables represent a topic of conversation for the scientist. So N represents the number of intelligent civilizations that might be out there in the galaxy. And R is the rate of star formation. And that was one thing that they felt confident they could calculate. So they thought, we can start with that at least. After that, it was the fraction of planets that might be able to form around those different stars. So if there's a star out there, might it have planets around it? Okay, if it did have planets, what's the rate, um, of, what's the fraction of planets that might actually be able to host life. So like here, they're, they may have said Earth, of course, obviously. They may have said Mars as well, maybe Venus. They didn't know for sure, but they seem like they might be hospitable to life in some way. So you take that percentage, and then the rate of uh, or the fraction of those plants that might host life that might actually have intelligent life. So where the chances that it, devol it evolves and develops into intelligence. So there's that. And then can that intelligent life communicate um, interstellarly? So not only are they smart, but can they learn to communicate uh, with a planet far away? So again, have they reached that level of intelligence? And then another critical piece, what's the length, the longevity of that civilization? So great, if it existed, does it still exist? How long did it exist? Did it reach a point where it could, it could still communicate with us today? Um, so these were obviously all would be you know, um, theoretical uh, answers to these, these different variables. But when they have their discussions and they kind of figure through like what they thought might be possible with all those, this was their estimate. Uh, our best estimate is that there are somewhere between 1,000 and 100 million advanced extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way. So that was 1961. So you can see that there was a lot of open thought towards the possibility of extraterrestrial life, a lot of it. I mean, that's a massive number. And this is before, you know, we had all the knowledge that we have now in terms of exoplanets and the size of the universe and so forth. All those numbers, I think, have, have um, gone up quite a bit. That, of course, led into the SETI program um, and the more, you know, uh, dedicated telescopes looking for different signals from other planets out there. Um, this I saw 
uh, someone was showing yesterday, the WOW signal from 1977. Um, this came from Ohio State Observatory, uh, the bigger observatory. And, and there was a guy named Dr. Jerry Eman who would go through a lot of the data that would come in from these radio, uh, radio telescopes. And you know, generally it's stacks of papers and you get lots of these ones and twos and threes. And those numbers were just sort of general radio noise, nothing to be um, interested by. But you know, these were being printed out overnight, 24-7. And so he would get a stack delivered to him for those overnight um, sessions. And so he's going through and he sees this string here that's, that's, that, that he circled, um, the 6EQUJ5. And anything over 5 was considered very significant. Anything over 9, they went to the alphabet. So you can see that that seemed like it was a pretty significant signal. And so he wrote, wow, <laughs> that's, that's his handwriting. That's why it's called the wow signal. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in that. Like, is this some kind of signal they were capturing? Of course, they couldn't replicate it. They couldn't find it anywhere else. Um, they never had enough data to really say that this was, that they could confirm and be conclusive about to say it was extraterrestrial. But, but Jerry Eman did believe um, that it may have been. He felt, he felt like it may have been but as a scientist, he, can't, he couldn't conclude it. I also spoke with um, Dr. Jill Tarter. So she was really instrumental in really getting the study off the ground, especially getting funding from NASA for at least for a while until that got pulled. Um, then she got you know, independent donors. But if anyone's seen the movie Contact with Jodie Foster um, based on this Carl Sagan novel, um, that character is based on Jill Tarter. So she knew Carl Sagan. So this is like, this is her life is looking for extraterrestrials. And the way she put it, I love this quote from her, um, basically saying that SETI has explored one glass of water out of the ocean. So just to put it in perspective, no, we haven't found anything while signal was there, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because we've barely begun. The universe is so expansive, the telescopes have only gotten just a fraction, really, of what might be available. That said, what if the ocean is empty? So I also spoke with a, another planetary scientist who I'd met during the Big Book of Mars. Um, his name is Pascal Lee, he's a brilliant planetary scientist. And he does uh, a different version of the Drake equation that he talks through, exploring a different answer to it. Um, and basically his, his hypothesis is, is that maybe the Drake equation, the answer is one, and we're it. And he gives a lot of reasons why. It's, and it's very interesting. And he talks about the fact that, first of all, we're very lucky to be here. Um, we are kind of a, an amazing anomaly. Dinosaurs, as we know, were here for hundreds of millions of years. Huge asteroid hits us, wipes them out, and a couple mammals survived. They hid, and they developed into us over a long time. And so we're here. That's pretty awesome. He talks about the fact that there's other intelligent creatures on Earth, like orcas, dolphins. They're underwater. They can't even look up at the sky, no matter what their intelligence is. They're not positioned in the way where they can even have these ideas. So we're kind of special and unique in that way. And he wonders, well, maybe we are truly that unique. He also describes that despite sort of the numbers of stars and other planets that might exist even just within this galaxy, there are things that we've learned about since the original Drake equation, like gamma ray burst, which is basically stars that explode. Imagine all the power of the sun exploding over the course of 24 hours. That happens quite a bit in the center of the galaxy. We're on the edge of the galaxy, which, which is helpful to, to Earth and to us humans. Basically, any planet that may have been developing intelligent life would be wiped out in an instant from a gamma ray burst. So again, despite some of those variables, you start looking at other things that might kind of take those away and, and prevent life from, from uh, developing. So this was a, a quote from him about that. He said, most people look at our galaxy and think that you're open-minded if you think we're not alone. That somehow you're forward-thinking by claiming there are other civilizations out there. The truth is, we might be it. It's a very daunting and unsettling perspective because if it's true, and it could be true, then wow, nobody's coming here to help us anytime soon. We're on our own, baby. It's a big, vast galaxy, and we are it. Nobody's going to show us how to warp drive for us unless we come back and visit ourselves from the future. I find it very intriguing that although we could be the, the natural evolution of things, we could be such a rare outcome that it's almost giving us some divine responsibility. So again, just interesting looking at these different perspectives coming from you know, scientists. He also acknowledges, this is talking about the Milky Way galaxy. Who knows what might be else out there elsewhere in the universe? There's like, trillions of galaxies. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around. 
So coming closer to the Earth, back in the, in, uh, the solar system, it was Oumuamua in 2017. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you might be familiar with that. This was this unusual object that was passing through the solar system. The data around it did not suggest it was anything that we know. It wasn't a comet. It wasn't some sort of asteroid. Um, and so Avi Loeb, head of the uh, science department in, at Harvard, he was the first to suggest maybe it's extraterrestrial nature. This could be some sort of alien architecture, archaeology type of thing passing through. Um, of course, he wrote a book on that called Extraterrestrial. And I had a chance to speak with him. And he shared just his thoughts about what this is and why. And, he, and his, sort of his frustration with SETI looking so far and not paying attention to what's closer to home. Um, he, of course, has since gone on to found the, the Galileo project. He got a lot of funding after writing Extraterrestrial, a lot of individual donors. And what's great about that is he's got so many people now who are um, volunteering scientists who want to help him. And now, because someone of his stature is looking into this, they feel better about doing it. That stigma is really going away. Um, so he's gathering his own data. As he said, the skies are not classified. He can collect his own data. If he's not going to get from the government, he has the tools and the means to get it himself, and I'm, I'm so curious to see what he finds over the next few years from that data. Now, coincidentally, as you know, I'm sure, December 2017, the New York Times writes a story and releases the Navy videos um, that show these UAP. So again, Oumuamua was 2017. This is happening in 2017. A lot of interesting breakthroughs at that point. Uh, so I spoke with, you know, in the book I get into the sort of the behind the scenes story of how the article came out um, that, that Leslie Kane wrote with Ralph Blumenthal, who was here yesterday, um, and Helene Cooper. So Christopher Mellon talked about, you know, why he went into this, uh, why he released the videos, why he met with them, as did Lou Elizondo. So it gets into all of that discussion. But what's interesting is like Christopher Mellon's you know, ultimate take on it is, and in the way to get that conversation accepted by the government officials and have these hearings is it's a matter of national defense. What's so amazing is, you know, you have the report here from June 2021, the government acknowledging that it doesn't know it's in our airspace. That's a crazy admission to say, yeah, there's stuff flying overhead and we don't know what it is. Um, and so the idea is we don't have, like, for the government to feel okay, they don't have to say that they're aliens. They just have to pay attention and try to find out what it is, whatever it is. Um, so Christopher Mellon's goal is, like, just wait up and let's not be surprised by something one way or the other. Um, so that's gotten people to start paying more attention. He's trying to keep the ball rolling with it. So I talked about a lot of different people that were helpful to the book that I met with, and I want to end with um, the guy who was probably most instrumental to helping me, which was Lee Spiegel. Uh, he connected me with David Marler. That's us at, at Dave's archive with Lee on, the, on Zoom behind me. Lee passed away about two weeks ago. Um, to my surprise, I, he was battling cancer, but had been very quiet about it. He was so helpful. Uh, I've known Lee for years. We both worked for AOL. We were news together. He was the UFO beat. Um, I was a sideshow beat. Um, so I knew Lee for a long time, and Lee just Lee introduced me to so many people, including Peter Robbins, um, opened a lot of doors for me. And so uh, I got I had a chance to share a few samples from the book with him before he passed. He responded to some text messages um, early August, but. Uh, it's such a sad loss for the UFO community. He was an amazing researcher and historian and journalist, and uh, his loss will certainly be felt. But I'm hoping that right now he's out there in the universe gathering the answers he's looked for, for uh, since the 1970s. So these are the books, The Big Book of Mars, and We Are Not Alone. As I said, launches October 17th. You can pre-order now. I, I had this slide written before, um, before the weekend, thanking you, and then asking those questions, and if anyone wants a book. I've sold out of We Are Not Alone already. I only had a limited number of copies from the publisher, but I do have The Big Book of Mars, a few copies left. But please pre-order. Um, it's really a fun book. It's beautiful, hardcover, filled with imagery and uh, um, ephemera, art, you know, archival photos, and so forth. Some never be seen information. Um, so I hope you all take a look and enjoy it. If anyone has questions, I think I have a few minutes left. We've gone close to time. Thank you. And I did it all without taking a sip of water, which I can't believe. So. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll um, turn it back over. Thanks all for attending. I appreciate it.